Did you bring a picture of this girl? Mm. You did? Mm. I'll be able to tell you if that's her. Okay. Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent acts and injury. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. Hey, Wendy, where did we leave off on this case? Oh, when we left off, we were about to learn who Haley's killer was. When did your break come? How long after something presented itself? January in 2000. Wow. Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So what happened? Tell us about this big break. Well, again, my luck, since I'm the lone man in the totem pole, uh, I was, I had to go in the office on New Year's Day. It was your week again, wasn't it? It was, it was. And um, our sergeant, Mark Barnard, received a call from Texas. It was the Rangers. Uh, he had previous encounters, again, not by a cat, but his networking, I'm sure. The Texas Rangers called and said that they had uh, arrested a suspect. And that he mentioned that he was in Kentucky and that there was a murder in, in Lexington, Kentucky that we, he would like to talk to us about. Wow. Yeah, it was, it was great. So he kind of told on himself. Yes. Yes. Um, I wouldn't say in a legal term that's telling on yourself, but you know he has something to get off he his chest. He knew something. Right. So what do you do then? Do you, do you just start rubbing your palms together and say, finally? Well, it, it's not that easy. So what happens is uh, Sergeant Barnard came over to my desk and said, hey, you're going to have to leave in four hours. We have a flight for you. They talked about who to send and it can be you or Davey or you and Davey. He said, I'd like to just send you. It's New Year's Day. And here's what we're worried about. He doesn't like anybody that's arrogant. He doesn't want anybody to come in dressed up in a suit. Good thing you didn't send my husband. <laughs> uh, I don't know you like that. But just to have a conversation sure, with the man. Just and sit and down. the ranger said that the suspect had already kicked one interviewer out of the room. So he wanted to be very clear that whoever we send just needs to have a conversation. Let's walk back because you talked about that they know this about him and they've been talking to him. And then he talked about one and talked about a murder in Lexington. Can you tell us what that conversation was that the Rangers had with him where that that happened even? Sure. What had happened there had been a murder in Texas and the Rangers had been assigned that murder. And it was within 48 hours that he talked to the Rangers and got caught. The Rangers did a fantastic job in Texas. They put him in the back of the car from his arrest. They actually caught him on the way to an attorney's house with a weapon. They only made assumptions that he was going to kill that attorney, but they caught him in the car at that point. They put him in the back of the ranger car and was taking him to the Del Rio County Jail. At that point, he said, I suppose I know what this is for. He thought it was about Lexington when, in fact, the rangers were charging him with murder in Texas. Oh. What, what was that story of that murder? Do you have any details about the one they picked him up on? I do. I do. And it's a, it's a sad story. There were two girls that were staying overnight with each other in a trailer park. And the 13-year-old Katie Harris had uh, Crystal Sayers over at her house overnight in their trailer. Crystal's parents had to go make a trip. Her father was looking at, for a job in another state. So Crystal was staying with Katie. 
During the middle of the night, Tommy Lynn Sells climbed in the rear window of the trailer and covered Katie's mouth and sliced her throat and sexually assaulted her. Wow. Crystal Sayers was laying in the top bunk at the time this occurred, and she woke up out of a dead sleep, saw Tommy Lynn Sells slice Katie's throat. So she was very quiet and closed her eyes. And, and she said, I don't think he can see me if I can't see him, right? Just like a young child mm -hmm. would when they're, when they're afraid. Well, when Tommy Lynn Sells was done murdering Katie Harris, he noticed Crystal Sells, or excuse me, Crystal Searles, and went up to the top bunk, reached his hand up, covered her mouth, and sliced her throat. She played dead because she was bleeding, and he crawled back out the window. As he was leaving, she waited and laid there. As she was bleeding, she crawled out of the front of the trailer and was yelling for the rest of the family members, and she thought they were all dead. She went a quarter mile. Of course, in Texas, your neighbors are far apart. She went a quarter of a mile down to the next house to an older couple and knocked on the door. The older gentleman noticed that she was covered in blood and let her in, and she couldn't even speak. She was so injured that he got her. She was motioning for a pencil, and she wrote the family's last name, and then she wrote dead as they were calling 911 for her. So this 10-year-old girl, being so brave, wow. was worried about the other family. It's pretty amazing. Wow. She was rushed to the hospital, and then um, that's where the rangers got involved in their investigation. And she survived that, right? She did. Next day, 24 hours later, she did a composite and identified Tommy Lynn Sells as the suspect that murdered Katie Harris. How did the Rangers catch Tommy Lynn Sells? Katie Harris's father had met Tommy Lynn Sells at a car dealership. And they had gotten an argument, and they suspected that Tommy had followed uh, Mr. Harris home and saw that the young girls were there. So his intention all along was to come back to the girls. Yes. So how ironic that this happened with 13-year-old Haley, and now we have another 13-year-old and a 10-year-old, all female. Yes. So he makes this utterance in the back of this car, I guess, with these... How did they catch him? The, from the composite and then taking it to Mr. Harris. And Mr. Harris said, that looks just like this gentleman. So when they stopped him, they had enough to arrest him on the weapon and going to this attorney's home because he was angry with the attorney. And later on, when we talk about Tommy Lynn Sells, you'll see that he has his own rules for society. So at that point, they got him in the car, and that's why he mentioned Lexington, not knowing that they had him on the murder. And the ranger, after meeting him, he, he was great with Tommy Lynn Sells. He got him to talk about the murder in Texas, and he confessed to that, that ranger about the murder of Katie Harris. When you talk about the ranger being great with Tommy, go into detail. What what do you mean by that? And is that something that's a go when you're with somebody? How do you, how do you get great with a bad guy like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, David. Um, what happens is you have to build rapport in a short period of time. If if you can believe that, so you know this man has done the worst thing in society. Mm -hmm. So now you're going to have to befriend this person. So calling them by first name is a great start. And he he called he when he called us he even said Tommy and we we're going Tommy who he was oh Tommy Lynn Sells we just arrested him for a murder Tommy wants to talk to somebody well the ranger used his first name you get him a cup of coffee anything they want if they smoke cigarettes you get them a cigarette and you approach them about the issue that you want to talk to them about. you approach it like it's no big deal you minimize their role and anything they've ever done. And then you start to empathize with them. Hey, I understand you had an argument with a gentleman earlier. And so we have seen that there's been a disruption in his house. I'd like to talk to you about that. Can you tell me anything that you know? And so you let them, what David and I and a bunch of the other homicide detectives used to say, you keep them talking and you get a great lie is better than no one talking at all. So if you can start them talking and even lying to you, then you're off to a really good start. And here's a psychological thing that once you get a person with that personality of time and cells, and you'll know that personality right off, 
they always want to tell you a story and how wonderful it is and the things that they have done is not their fault. And then you can start using what they tell you against them. Wow. So you get the call from this ranger and were you just blown away? Were you just thinking, here we are some eight months later? Yes, I, I, was, are. I was a little excited, but a little nervous too. Because if you've ever been to Del Rio, it's an East Jesus. So it's way out there. So you land in San Antonio, but you have to drive almost through the tip of Mexico and then back up into a corner of Texas. What so kind we, of preparation um, did you do once you got there talking to the Texas Rangers? Well, prior to that, I, uh, Mark Barner, Sergeant Barner, and I talked. We, I went and bought a cooler once I landed there because I want his DNA, right? And I'm going to have to fly back with it. So I want to get the, the correct equipment to keep the things cold, get the suave, and keep them secure. So a cooler is like a carry-on to me. So that's what I'm going to bring back with me if I can get his DNA. So at that point, um, I call the ranger. I have his number. Once I land, I call the ranger. And, and of course, I rented the best car I could. Flat Texas, fast, convertible. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Got to get there. Right. So I called the ranger and I asked uh, what kind of personality he had. I told the ranger what I was wearing because I, when I flew, I kind of I wore a button-up shirt, white shirt, a tie, and just dockers. And he said, well, you might want to change. Come in in just a polo shirt and some jeans. He said, and, and he already kicked one out, so here's why he kicked him out. And so he said, just don't do that mistake. What did he do? Why did he kick the other guy out? Um, he, the other interviewer came in accusatory right off the beginning that he already had enough evidence to lock him up. And that's not going to work with Tommy Lynn Sells. Mm -hmm. So um, from that point forward, I just kind of went over my notes at a road stop rest of Halo McCone's case and details that I knew only he would know and uh, walked up to the jail and the sheriff let me in, and the Texas Ranger introduced himself. He said, I'm not going to go back there with you because he just told me about a murder, and I don't want to involve my rapport with your rapport. Um, we'll set you up in a supply closet. That's the only place they had for me to interview Tommy Lynn Sells, and they used a VHS recorder. Wow. Well, I have to ask, when you were on that plane and driving in your little fast car down to Del Rio, were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you just thinking, oh my God, I could vomit. I'm so nervous. Or were you just like, I'm excited. We finally got this. Yes. My favorite part of the job, believe it or not, is not testifying in the court. My favorite part is interviewing, getting information and trying to get the admission or confession of suspects. I love doing that. So, so I was excited. You were in your element. Yes. So you walk into your little supply room, you I guess, push aside your paper clips and binder clips. And was Tommy in there or did they bring him to you? They brought him to me. So I had changed in the car. I put my jeans on and a polo shirt, didn't tuck it in. I asked all the questions. Do you, are you allowed to smoke in here? And of course, it's a supply room with paper towels, toilet paper, cleaner. And they said, they look at me like, oh, this guy's never going to get anything. He's slow. Obviously, we're in a <laughs> closet with cleaner. You're not going to. And they said, obviously not. And I asked him, how about coffee? Where do I get coffee? And does Tommy drink coffee? And the sheriff confirmed it. So I said, I want two cups of coffee. Just bring the cream and sugar, and we're going to leave it on the desk. So I already had it laying on his cup on the desk because I don't know what he wants in his coffee or if he even likes it. Now, I say this nonchalantly, but I realize now we've got a gentleman that has two murders that I know of. Uh, and I know he's got hot coffee, and I know we're in a small room. And I'm going to ask him to admit to me that he's done these terrible things. So I kind of positioned some paper towel boxes on the floor to where I can at least grab them and throw them up in case he throws the hot coffee so you're on You're going to be me. wearing this hot coffee on your right. polo. Right. So I prepare the room for the interview. And uh, I remember the VHS. I was laughing because we have recording devices in Lexington. We have them in the interview room and they're high definition. But... The VHS tape, I remember the camera being flipped around so I could see myself and doing the test. And then Tommy Lynn comes in and he's scruffy, long, he's got like a mullet, and he's in a jumpsuit. First thing he asked me for is a cigarette. 
first thing I give them is a cigarette in the closet because I had some in my pocket because I know I'm going to be interviewing a suspect. So <laughs> so he sets it down. Your first appearance, I know you said he was having his mullet and in his jumpsuit. Would you have imagined from your first impression of Tommy, are you thinking guy next door? Are you thinking, oh, he's creepy as can be? I'm thinking this man's been through the process before. So I have to be ready. Yeah. But I'm still excited. It's it's a very different feeling. You're excited, you're nervous, and you're wondering what makes this guy tick. And you, the feeling of wanting to know what makes him tick and that you can help the community in the long run overweighs the nervousness and making mistakes. When you talk about thinking it wasn't his first time in the process at a rodeo since you're in Texas, what made you think that? And what's the difference in that when you handle somebody that's been through the show before what happens is when you when they approach you you can it's difficult to say you can tell by you look for tattoos regular tattoos are different than prison tattoos right there's more art behind your regular tattoo prison tattoos are black and white on the knuckles and on the neck so i instantly saw that one was on around his neck or on his neck and then he came in like he wanted to control the situation Right. And that's a dead giveaway. And he's very comfortable in the flip flops and jumpsuit. So I assume he's been through the process before. So how I'm going to approach this is I'm going to tell him I'm going to give him two orders first. I'm going to tell him to sit down and I'm not going to sit down because I want to be a little higher than him right from the meeting. And I don't shake his hand right away. So those are the two things I don't do. Why do you not shake his hand? Because I don't want him to be able to turn my hand and get the if psychologically, if a person to me, they're going to take control of you by the way they shake your hand. Like if they turn their hand and they're on top to them, they know that they're going to su- be superior because you let them turn your hand. So I don't even want to go there. So I'm going to tell him to sit down. I'm going to ask him if he needs anything. So he walks in and you say, have a seat. Mm-hmm. And, and I tell him, ask him how he's doing. And I actually tell him, well, you're in a situation. I'm sorry you're in that situation. So you're empathizing and, with him. And yeah. He, he might not have been expecting that. He doesn't expect it at all. So we proceed to just do the interview. And, of course, you have these legal process you have to do. So now him going through the process before, you know, advising them of their Miranda rights, you've got to do it very carefully and let them – Think about it, but yet you want to get right into the conversation after you read it and you ask them if they're willing to talk to you. And his personality, he wanted to know what I knew. So I knew it wouldn't be that difficult after I read his Miranda rights and then looked at him and I said, Are you, you want to talk about the situation I'm here for? I'm from Lexington. And you said you had something to say about Lexington. And that's why I'm here. And, and his response I don't remember exactly, but I do remember him saying, well, what you, what do you do? And I had to tell him I'm a homicide detective. He says, well, I guess you know why I asked for, for a detective from Lexington. That's what I remember, our banter back and forth. I said, yeah, but I've been asked to come to a lot of places and people just want sympathy or a visitor. A lot of people want visitors because they're alone in jail for a while. I said, so I need to know that I'm talking to the right person. So you turned it back back around on him. Yes. And what does he say when you say, are you the right person? So he says, well, I want to talk to you about a girl in Lexington. I said, that's why I'm here. I'd like to talk to you too. So tell me a little bit about where you're from. Because you don't want to go right into what they've done. They're not going to tell you. They may tell you, but they won't be honest, right? Because he knows in the long run, this may go to court as well. So he's building his defense the same time he's telling you what he's done. Trust me, that happens a lot in the interview room. We talk about how he was raised, where he traveled. Very interesting things on Tommy Lynn Sells and him traveling across country. We spent a lot of time about where the system failed him before we even talked about Haley's Haley's murder. He blames the judicial system in Washington State about not keeping him in when he asked for mental mental behavior assistance because he was arrested there. And he said if it weren't for Washington State, these other things wouldn't have happened. And uh, 
Then he talks about how he was in jail in Lexington, Kentucky, and they let him right out the same night. And he was working over in Transylvania University as a groundskeeper. Uh, it was pretty amazing the things that he did. He worked at a carnival in Ohio. And every place that he went, he wreaked havoc on at least one person's life. Wow. Yeah. He talked about a murder he committed in Ohio. And I kind of stopped him. And I said, we will get back to that murder because now there's three that I know about. And I know the ranger didn't bring up three. And I told him we'd get back to that because I'm interested in that too. But we need to talk about Haley. And then we started about the details of Haley McCone's murder here in Lexington, Kentucky. How did he get around when you talk about him getting around the country? He got around by train. Now, it's very interesting because I asked him, I, I said, how do you know which train is going in which direction? And I know it's strange because I'm there about a homicide, but that you, that you get to know a person and you learn for the next case. And he said, well, I never learned which direction the trains were going. I would always jump on with somebody who knew they were going somewhere. So he would follow a homeless person onto that train and go to the next state. Wherever that may be. Wherever the train stopped and he felt warm enough, he stopped. So when you say, let's talk about, let you divert him back. Let's talk about this. Did you call her by name or did you say this, this girl? At the beginning, I didn't call her by name and I wanted it. It's another technique. Once you start talking about the murder if you put a name to it, his personality, you have to really judge the personalities of who you're talking to. But his personality, he could identify with a name. And he had asked her her name when he had the encounter with Haley. So I wanted to see his, and I didn't know that at first until he told me. And I wanted to see his expression when I started using her name. And, and what was it? He was fine with it. He was fine with calling her Haley. So do you then say, well, tell me about this. Did he just open right up and the floodgates flowed and he just started from beginning and went to end? Right. I talked to him. It took about six hours and then we took a break and then we talked two more hours. So we went through several cigarettes and probably two cups of coffee a piece. So it, it's, when I talk about an interview, it's not something you, it's an hour and I'm out of there. Like I said, we talk about him first and we get to know each other. And of course, I, if you have to tell them, I don't never tell them the truth about me, but if they ask, I always lie to them and tell them something interesting that I think they want to hear. And eventually we started talking about Haley and how he came to Lexington on a train and he had worked in Lexington for a little bit and he liked his alcohol. He admitted that he got arrested for DUI. When he got out that night, he started walking to the University of Kentucky. And when it was getting light out, uh, he went to the park. And he noticed a woman walking a dog. And he said, I was going to attack that woman that morning. But when he went up and asked her how her day was going, he said, that dog was mean. He was <laughs> not going to deal with that dog, too. So he said he left and went to towards Transylvania University. And I said, well, tell me how you went to Transylvania. Why did I ask that? Because then I'll know if he's been in Lexington, Kentucky. So he gave me the directions on how we walked to Transylvania University and actually talked about the steps, the several steps in front of the steeple building. And he said, I sat there and met some homeless people. And we went, he tried to describe it. He said, I went to this place where they hand out jobs and then you can find a job for the day. And when you come back, you get paid. And I said, where was that? He said, it's on a side street, it's wind something. Wind. So I knew he was, he was telling me the truth. So he went to work that day. When he got off of work that afternoon, he went back to that park because he knew the train was going by there. He was sitting on the steps, or excuse me, on the picnic table having a cigarette. He had bought some beer. And he said, this young girl walked up to him and asked him for a cigarette and she sat there and smoked a cigarette for a minute and he said he thought a minute and he said I offered her beer and she said yeah I'll take a beer he said I knew she was young so I said let's go out towards the woods there so you don't get in trouble for drinking a beer and they both walked out there and he said I reached over to hug her and she started fighting back and that's when uh, he choked her and killed her did he know that she lived that close to where they were? No. No. 
No, he asked her her name. Uh, that's how he knew. When he gave her the cigarette, he asked, you know, they had small talk. Haley, mm -hmm. how are you doing? And uh, he said uh, she had on, she, he, she des he described her top. He said he took that off and left her shorts. And then he covered her body up. He knew she was dead. So he covered her body up and took her bike over to the north side of town and sold that for more money. And then hopped a train to Louisville, Kentucky. Stayed there for a few days and then hopped a train uh, to Texas. Did wow. he, when he talked about uh, strangling her, did he do that barehanded or did he use any instruments? Or Yes, he, and on the interview, if, if it's on video, if you ever saw it, he even used the motion with his hands around her neck. Yes, he used his hands to strangle her. But what was very important, he told me what brand he was drinking and uh, we found those bottles out there and he told me about what brand cigarettes he was smoking and we found of course, we found a lot of cigarettes, but so at that point, I knew I eventually at the end of the interview, I was going to ask him for a DNA swab. So he strangled her because she fought back. Was there any sexual assault or was it just he was angry, so he strangled her? He he tried to, he, he called, he tried to make moves on her and she started fighting back. So he killed her. He never admitted to sexually assault, sexual assaulting her. And he never admitted that about Katie Harris, but they did a sexual assault kit on Katie Harris in Texas and found out that she was sexually assaulted. In Haley's situation, her body was in such a state of decomposition, you wouldn't be able, it was undetermined and you wouldn't be able to tell. Did he go into any detail when he was talking about uh, strangling her? Did he talk anything about what it was like or what, how she responded or anything? He did. Um, and I asked him if she screamed or he said all she did was grab his hands and try to fight back. He said when she went limp, he knew that he had killed her. And so he held her neck even longer just to make sure. He said, I didn't want her to suffer. And he laid her down and covered her body and immediately left with her bike. Wow. So the interesting part is I asked him also in the interview to describe the bike and he talked about the orange paint on the bike. So I knew exactly that he was the person we were looking for because that was the description of the bike we put on the posters. Yeah, because I remember, I think, uh, correct, if I remember correctly, she had spray painted some different parts of it and made it. It was very unique, which I think was frustrating us that we couldn't find that bike. Yeah, he sold that bike to a homeless person, and I'm sure they rode off with it. Did the bike ever turn up? No, never. It never turned up? No. Chris, let me ask you. The, uh, so... He, he describes what he did to Haley and what he did after that. What else did you, at, at what point does your uh, interview end? Well, it doesn't end with Haley because I wanted to show him that I was interested in him. So I went back to, you told me about, you were working for a circus in Ohio and that you had trouble in Ohio. So I asked him about that. He said there was a, uh, circus worker that didn't follow one of his rules and had started a problem with him. So he had used a hammer and, and killed him. Well, tell us about the rules, because you alluded to that earlier. Tell us in the world of Tommy Lynn Sills, what rule did he violate that he got hammered? Well, that's a great question. I asked him in the interview, you keep talking about if you break one of my rules, then you're done with me. I'm going to kill you or are you going to I'm going to hurt you real bad. And at that point, I did get a little nervous in the room he said, well, for instance, do you believe me that I killed Haley? And I said, yeah, I believe you. He said, that's a good thing because if you don't believe me and I'm telling you the truth, you broke one of my rules. And in the same way, if anybody else broke any rule with children, because I asked him, I said, okay, that's one of your rules. And I knew from talking to him that he had a girlfriend in Texas and she had children. I said, so what are the rules for the children? You have murdered two 13-year-old girls. There was a 10-year-old girl that you slit her throat. What are the rules? And he turned to me and pointed at the video camera, and he said, turn that thing off. And at that point, I said, I apologize. Let's talk about other things. And he was talking about other bodies. And I said, well, I'd like to get the ranger in here because I don't know. You're describing places where you put these bodies, and I'm not familiar with that. But I'll be happy to stay in here with you while you talk to the ranger. So the ranger had been up all night, so we had waited till the next day 
and had brought the ranger back in and we had sat down and he told about uh, more bodies and more murders that he had committed. So what was the children rule? He never told me. When he told me to shut that thing off, I apologized and I wasn't going to go there again. Because the interview might have ended, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Exactly. Well, let me ask you this. because <laughs> At least. Or I, I could have ended it. Yeah, because yeah, one of the rules was probably wearing a tie, so it's a good <laughs> thing you ditched that in the car. But let me ask you this, because, you know, we've sat in there before, and like you said, you get lied to. Nobody tells the truth. They tell a version of the truth. What did it feel like when he started talking about more than one like that? What was going on in your mind? Was it one of those things, I can't wait to tell everybody back home or because that's, those are the things that just don't happen that often. And it's funny you said that. That was the first thing that went through my mind. I can't wait to tell the other detectives that this guy even wants to talk about other murders. And I'm going to be able to help them find these bodies. Because I don't know how, how long it's been since he had murdered other people. And just his entire story was very interesting how he put blame on other people. Like, it's the other person's fault why he had to kill him. You know, the circus guy didn't follow his rules. So he had to go. He had to go. Same with me. He said, shut that thing off. I was going to follow his rules. You know, you know, it's just very strange what he found were the moral rules of society. Um, one of Tommy Lincells was on that we said some networks were carrying. He said the most interesting thing, and I find it that we do this when we investigate homicides. His phrase was, see... You guys, meaning detectives, you guys make everything so difficult when it's really simple. It's the simplest thing. Someone gets mad. You just have to know who they're mad at, and then they get killed. And that, that was Tommy Linsell's. And he's right, because how often, David, have we been asked, what do you think he was thinking? Where would he go next? And you can't, with Tommy Linsell's and people like him, you can't put your brain and their thought pattern because they don't think the same as every normal human being. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. This podcast is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.